Welcome to another episode of Cyber Secrets. Let's cover some email basics real quick. SMTP, or Simple Mail Transport Protocol, is usually port 25, and that's an outgoing protocol. POP3, or Post Office Protocol, version 3, is an incoming, and that's usually on port 110, and IMAP is usually on port 143. Ports definitely may vary depending on how the configuration is, especially trying to get past some of the firewalls. But one thing to note is webmail is not an email protocol. It is HTTP or HTTPS. It's a web-based protocol. Once the message is sent to the web server, it is then transferred to the email server on the server side and then outbound. Emails are generally pushed into two sections. The header, which contains routing and other specific information, and then there's the body, which is the content the user is going to read. Generally, in the header, the only things the user usually gets to change is the to, the cc, and the bcc, along with the subject. Assuming we hit send, we're now going to look at the header. As you can see, you can see the source of the message. This is the true source, the original IP address, and the IP address on the internet side. We also see a message ID, which is the unique ID or fingerprint or digital fingerprint to the message. We're also going to take a look at the user's client or the version information. This can be useful in forensics. Now on the other side we have the body and of course this is what the people read. Now let's take a look at the header in a little bit more depth. The IP address that I'm underlining right now is the internal IP address of the system that actually sent the email. The one to the right of it is the ISP or the external IP address. For example if they're behind some sort of network address translation or NAT this is the IP address that you're going to have to deal with if you do have to sort a crude order. So the 192.168 is a non-internet routable IP, as the other one is clearly a routable IP owned by Quest.net. Now let's look at the email from an evidence standpoint. The very top, the received from, Mount Performa, that's 74.208.4.194, this is the last server to log routing activity. May be able to get uh, traffic logs if necessary, assuming the logs are being kept on the server. The originating IP address, the 192.168.0.177, is the internal IP address from the system that actually sent the message. Sometimes the computer even leaks out the name of the computer name, which could be unique enough to identify the suspect. The external IP address from the source, that 184.196. 112.105, this is the outside IP address, which is usually an ISP, for example. If you can't get any information related on the uh, suspect, a lot of times you may have to go to this ISP with a court order, and they would give you who logged in at what time to that account, or potentially even the systems on the inside. As far as the relay server, this is the server that actually accepted the email to begin with. The message ID, this is a digital fingerprint and is supposed to be unique to every single email that is uh, sent through a system. However, it is easy to spoof, and sometimes spammers do forget to change this message ID, so it's not inconceivable that you may see duplicates while looking at spoofed emails or a lot of spam. Of course, the timestamp. Yes, this could be uh, spoofed. It may be invalid. It's only as trustworthy as the system that adds the timestamp. Of course, the from, this can easily be spoofed or forged. Most people in a normal email investigation, let's say a domestic dispute or some sort of stalking, usually do not go through the effort of actually changing this. However, spammers and sophisticated suspects can easily alter it, making it irrelevant. And the user agent. If it is unique enough, sometimes you can tie it back to a specific suspect, such as a version number, things in that aspect. Again, if it's a spammer or sophisticated attacker or suspect, it's probably going to be fake. I know I keep referencing sophisticated suspects or spammers. Let's just go through the anti-forensics or anti-evidence. So the very top, unfortunately, the routing information is only as good as the systems that add it to the email. For example, uh, an attacker could send it through a remailer, an anonymous remailer, remove the original writing information, and send it through a hacked email server to control all the logging, even through a botnet, or even just through somebody else's network. If you do the latter, the attacker could spoof the MAC address and the computer name before they connect, and never connect to personal identifiable accounts or network addresses 
that aspect would make things a lot more difficult to trace it down. So now let's talk about the rest of the email, the rest of the header content. I'm going to go through just a basic fake email. Let's say you go into the command line. You telnet into a specific mail server, probably the target's email server, on port 25 for the SMTP. The basic command is e-hello, which tells the target server, hello, I want to talk, I want to send a message. The mail from doesn't necessarily have to be real. Some email servers, it does need to be real, but it doesn't have to be the attacker's address. It could be anybody else that's already been authenticated to the system. The RCPT2, this is where the email is actually going to go to. So it does not have to be to in the actual email, but this is where the email server is going to route it. The next line, data. Once you hit data and then enter, everything after that is part of the email. So the message ID, the date, the from, the subject, the user agent, that's all going to be part of the header information of the email. Then there's a carriage turn line feed, and then the body of the email, the message. After you're done, you'd hit enter, and then hit a single period, and then enter one more time, and this is going to tell the server that the client is done, and to queue the message. This is how easy it is to send an email address, because SMTP, POP, IMAP, those are relatively simple, stupid. And unless you put any advanced security mechanisms in place, it's really easy to not only spoof an email, but also relay. A lot of email servers are not open relay, but they are always going to be a relay. Sometimes you have to authenticate. Sometimes you just have to have an email address or email account on the email server. Then it automatically allows you to relay it. So in conclusion, emails can contain a lot of good evidentiary information, but emails can be altered. Nothing's 100% when it comes down to it, but if you know that it's not, then you judge the level of effort, the knowledge of the suspect, and their access, and that's going to help you out quite a bit. As far as pen testing, it's a lot of good ways of uh, sending spear phishing emails and probably getting past all their spam filters. The Cyber Secrets web series covers computer forensics, hacking, and everything in between. Thank you for your continued support of Cyber Secrets. With the reboot of the different series, we want to ask if you have ideas for future content or suggestions for improvement. Please let us know. Click subscribe for new episodes of Cyber Secrets.